Good morning, I'm Wimala, and today is November the 1st. It's uh, beautiful and sunny here. It was really uh, hazy yesterday in, this, in the area. There were even a lot of planes canceled out of O'Hare in Chicago. But today is clear and beautiful, and I think we're supposed to get up to 68. Doesn't sound like fall weather. So hope your Halloween was uh, safe, not too scary, didn't, and that you didn't eat too much candy. I had uh, dot medical appointments yesterday, so my Halloween was seeing the receptionist in two different offices. One had on all the kinds of different Halloween, you know, witches hats, and in the other office, the receptionist had uh, uh, cat ears. So that was, that was my Halloween. So we're still reading. I wasn't here Friday. Be, oh no, I, maybe I was and had retreat, went on retreat. We're reading from Pema Chodron's book, How We Live is How We Die. And so far, this is another incredible book. She is such a good, she explains things in such a, such a way that it's so much, uh, it makes so much sense and it's easy to understand some very uh, complex, <laughs> complex ideas. And we were reading about consciousness uh, before. So this is chapter nine and it's called The Two Truths. And uh, she writes, she has some different things in the book where she has two truths about something and, you know, some numbered things, but I don't think her list get greater than two things. So let's read this and then we'll sit. Not for a long time, but uh, a good way to just get, get the mind a, a little bit calmed down and have a good day. The two truths. In the Buddhist teachings, there's an idea that everything has two levels of truth, <clears throat> relative and absolute. How we experience life when we're immersed in it and how we experience it from a distance when we can get a vaster perspective. I like to think of the relative truth as what goes into the story of an ordinary day what we see and hear and think, how we feel about the people and objects we encounter, how we relate to our world, how things appear and function. Trees grow up from the ground, they have branches and leaves, and many of them lose their leaves in the fall. These statements are truth because everyone agrees to them there's a consensus reality that we agree on. We say they're not speaking the truth. If someone says trees go downward from the sky, we say they're not speaking the truth because that isn't the consensus reality. For human beings, the existence of tree is an agreed upon relative truth. But we can guess that termites have no sense of tree. They see the same thing in terms of what it means for them as food and a place to live. Let me block a little bit of sound. So something as uncontroversial as a tree really depends on who's looking at it. When they're looking at it, how closely they're looking, and what they're interested in seeing. I'm just going to interrupt here because uh, I drove with a, a good friend to the retreat. We drove together and the fall trees on the way to Racine up, up in Wisconsin above us, uh, some of the country roads that we went on just so we could see more of the fall colors were just incredible. And of course it depended on when we were seeing them because the leaves are falling fast, you know, before long and before it starts to snow, those trees will be bare. And so um, 
and we were looking closely because we had the time and we had the route. So, yeah. So something as uncontroversial as a tree really depends on who's looking at it, when they're looking at it, how closely they're looking, and what they're interested in seeing. So we are interested in seeing the fall colors. So we were pleasantly surprised in a few weeks, maybe we would be disillusioned. This is true about everything in the universe. Our relative world is more tentative and open to interpretation than we generally give it credit for being. That's an understatement, right? This is where relative and absolute come together. When we perceive something without our usual concepts, we discover sunyata, or emptiness, an often misunderstood word. Emptiness doesn't refer to a void. It doesn't suggest a cold, dark world in which nothing has any meaning. What it means is that everything we examine is free from or empty of our conceptual interpretation, our views and opinions. Nothing in this world is fixed. Nothing is permanently and definitively one way or another. All phenomena are just as they are, free of our value judgments and preconceptions. I see a mouse and think cute. Another person feels fear. Another gets aggressive, so watch out, little mouse. But the mouse isn't inherently any of these things, despite all our ideas and opinions about this small creature mouse. That mouse just remains mouse, just as it is, free of our conception, conceptual overlays. Absolute truth refers to this open, unpinpointable un nature of the world and everything in it, ourselves, other living beings, our environment, everything. It's called absolute because it doesn't depend on anything else to be true. It's just the nature of how things are. When we can take a step back and simply relax with this absolute truth, we will be far less inclined to insist that life has to be on our terms and far more inclined to think of how our actions affect the whole. When the astronaut Edgar Mitchell walked on the moon in 1971 and saw the Earth from that vast perspective, he realized that it was just one Earth and that all the divisions humans had created the visions that caused so much pain were arbitrary and meaningless. He realized that we earthlings had to work together and that separateness was an illusion. From out there on the moon, he said, international politics looks so petty. Mitchell had an absolute experience of how things really are. When he returned home, this perspective continued to affect how he lived, yet he still had to relate with the relative world and how it triggered his propensities and caused him to put up barriers between himself and others. The very same pain causing barriers that from space he had seen as meaningless. When I was very young, I had an experience of the absolute that was so straightforward it might be helpful to share it here. One summer night, I was lying on my back, looking up at the stars, as I had done many times. Like so many others throughout time, I was enthralled by the feeling it gave me to gaze up at those stars. On this particular evening, however, something shifted for me, and I had one of those light bulb experiences. I suddenly knew, without really thinking about it, that this was the same vast space that children in ancient Greek had experienced, that prehistoric people had, had experienced. I knew that before I was born it had been here, and that after I died it would be here. For years this was my own personal secret, 
something I didn't want to spoil by talking about it. Seeing the stars was a relative experience happening on a New Jersey night in 1943. The sure understanding that this space had always been there and would always be there was an absolute timeless experience. The word absolute sounds more impressive than relative, but we don't need to think one truth is superior to the other. We can fully experience a tree's beauty without thinking that our way of looking at the tree is the way to look at it. We can enjoy its shade on a hot day while knowing that it is far more mysterious than we generally assume. Our aim on the spiritual path is not to get rid of the relative and dwell in emptiness. The two truths go hand in hand. The terms relative and absolute give us ways to talk about the same subject from different angles. When we say that nothing goes through the bardos, we're speaking from a bigger perspective, from the absolute point of view. And remember the bardos are just those gaps in between. The consciousness that runs through all our moments and bridges the gap between lifetimes is constantly dissolving and reforming. Try as we might, we can never find anything to put our finger on. In the absolute, no one lives, no one dies, and no one goes through the bardos. But in the relative, when a loved one passes, we grieve. From the relative point of view, we experience pain and pleasure, hope and fear, thoughts and perceptions, life and death. From the relative perspective, everything we do affects ourselves and our world, and everything we do matters. Our actions always have consequences. Padma Sambhav Bawa, commonly known as Guru Rinpoche, the 8th century Indian teacher who established Buddhism in Tibet, said, My view is higher than the sky, but my attention to my actions and their effects is finer than flower. Even though he was an enlightened master, he knew how crucial it was to pay attention to the relative details of his life and the consequences of his actions. The Buddha didn't teach his disciples so they would end up in some frigid intellectual realm divorced from day-to-day -day experience. On the contrary, he gave many teachings on how we should conduct ourselves in ways that will bring ourselves and others joy and relief from pain. These teachings include profound, concrete advice on how to live our lives and how to approach death. They are based on the two truths, the understanding that although nothing is really happening on the ultimate level, we would all rather experience happiness than suffering. I think that's, that's really important, these last two, based on the Buddha's teachings. These teachings include profound, concrete advice on how to live our lives and how to approach death. They are based on the two truths, the understanding that although nothing is really happening on the ultimate level, we would all rather experience happiness than suffering. Another beautiful chapter. So the relative and the uh, ultimate, the relative, the relative and the absolute. So we see that every we see that every day. It's uh, around here. If people even have different opinions about things like chipmunks and squirrels and uh, oh, even the birds. You know, they're either an, a pest or they're something that they delight in and they. They enjoy seeing them and uh, see them as uh, also they were they were here on this land before people came and you know turned it into a suburb. So um, we can see it all the time everywhere. I, I really like this chapter. 
So the next chapter is called Propensities. I think it's an important chapter that we'll read because she says, before going any further in describing the journey after death and the experiences of the next Bardos, I think it's important to take a pause and present some words from the heart about how to work with our mind, our emotions, and our propensities. Because these are the things, she says, that we'll carry forward. How we work with our mind, emotions, and propensities while journeying through the ups and downs of the bardo of this life is what we'll take with us as we travel forward. Uh, this, is a, this is a quote that I really like, and uh, Trungpa Rinpoche, when he was asked what goes through the bardos or what goes beyond this life, he answered with a big smile, all your bad habits. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Sometimes I've quoted in this saying, all your, all your uh, negative karma, but I think this is much better, all your bad habits. So <laughs> she says, I take this, I took this to mean that whatever habits I hadn't befriended and let go of in this life would travel forward through the intermediate state to be passed on to some poor infant in the future. So that's gonna be, that will be Thursday. That's wonderful. So let's sit a little bit. Uh, we, we have about, we have about maybe 10 minutes. So if you can keep sitting after I, I leave, that's always good because you'll already be settled down and if you can just keep sitting for a while, that's wonderful. So let's see if there are any questions. Okay, well, let your body just relax, but be, uh, let your back be straight to help support you and uh, roll your shoulders back and then relax and then let go, let the spine just support you. You can have, if you need pillows or cushions to uh, support your body, the same way you would do in restorative yoga and uh, have something that can hold the body where it needs to be because sometimes our bodies don't want to work and they don't feel the, the way that we can relax so we can use supports for, for the body. Use what you need to help you get into the right posture. Don't punish yourself. That's not what this is about. But if you're in too much discomfort, of course your body will uh, not let your mind relax at all. So it, would, it will make you think, oh, I can't meditate. So, but the body will know when you're starting to go into this process of sitting or practicing and it will begin to help and respond if you make it more and more a habit. The body will, okay, this is when we're supposed to be awake and uh, she's not gonna pay a lot of attention to these thoughts, so maybe we'll just calm down a bit. She's not gonna, it's not feeding time. So, hmm, you can close your eyes if, if you can, uh, you may have you may have uh, some little ones that you need to pay attention to, but you can still sit. They might want it. They might see you become very the same way pets do. Children will often come and want to be near you when they see you being quiet and not distracted, and then they can just feel that good energy. Be aware of the body breathing. Breathing in and out through your nose if you can. I think this is a time to be so appreciative 
of the gift of this body, that it does these things automatically for us. And if we take good care of it, it does these things really well. We can take a deeper, longer breath and it just becomes natural. Don't force your breath, let it be your natural breath. But if you feel very distracted, you can always take two or three deep breaths in and then blow out just to help you become centered and present. So you want your mind and your body and your movements to all be in the same place in the present moment. And let your breathing settle down and be aware of the breath. Remember, either observe the breath around your nostrils or just be aware of the belly moving out a little as you inhale and contracting a bit as you exhale. Keep relaxing, let your spine support you. So you can relax your shoulders. You don't have to be holding tight. Just keep letting go. Be aware of your body and what's going on in your body. Pay attention when you feel something rising up, maybe something shifting from pleasant to unpleasant, or you notice that it's much easier to just be able to practice, to sit, practice, uh, even with noise around you, even in a less than perfect spot. So you're noti noticing uh, com good, comfortable, positive uh, changes, but you still notice them. It's still that 
energy in your body shifting around. Most importantly, don't judge yourself. Don't think, I don't get this. <laughs> there's, there's really nothing to get. We're really working with our body and our mind. To just help us live a happier life. A more contented life. Are you relaxed or are you on edge? See your thoughts rise, but don't feed those thoughts. Don't feed your thoughts, your stories. Sometimes we all just have our stories that we're playing in our heads all the time. Stop feeding that. So we can just allow those thoughts to, they'll rise up, don't push them down, but no need to get involved or feed them. So we can see the thoughts arise. And then if we don't pay attention to them and react, then they'll just go away. Our thoughts don't need to be controlling us. Their thoughts are not bad, but we need to be aware that their thoughts, their reactions often, they're not truth tellers all the time.
as we end our practice together, let's remember, may everything I do and say and think today be done not only for my own benefit, but for the benefit of all sentient beings. I can be a refuge for myself, and in doing that, other beings can find refuge by being harmless, by being kind and friendly, by sharing. So, have a beautiful day. Thank you for being with me. You're a big part of my practice. And I hope you have a beautiful day and that your weather is as delightful where you are as it is here. For the day, it will change. <laughs> so thanks.